You are listening to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast Network. For more great filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, head over to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Today, we're talking with legendary filmmaker Roger Corman. So, welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast, where it's all about learning how to make and market your independent film online. And now your host, Jason Buff. Welcome to the Indie Film Academy podcast. I'm your host, Jason Buff. Thanks for joining us here today. We have a super guest on. Today, we're talking with one of my heroes, Mr. Roger Corman. Now, just between us, I was scared as hell to just give Roger Corman a call. Um, I was sitting in my office and I got uh, a, his very nice secretary told me a time to call in. And it's kind of like all of a sudden I was on the phone with one of my heroes. Roger Corman really is someone who all indie filmmakers should know about and should definitely understand his contribution to the world of independent film. He's also responsible for giving the first break to a lot of people that my generation considers the filmmakers that really um, influenced them, like Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, Jonathan Demme, um, Joe Dante, and Ron Howard. So what I want to do is listen to some of them talk about how Roger Corman influenced their filmmaking. The first interview I want to go to is with Jonathan Demme, who said this about Roger Corman in the documentary, Roger Corman, Hollywood's Wild Angel, a 1978 documentary. Well, in any film that I've ever worked on with Roger, there are three main elements that he's looking for. One is humor, which he considers tremendously important. Another is action, which he considers very important. And another is sex, which he considers important, but not quite as important as the other two elements, I don't think. But it's funny the way these things pop up, because, for example, in my script for uh, Caged Heat, hand your script in, and what Roger does is sometimes he'll give the notes right on the script and hand it back to you. So you get the script back and you get little little marginal references like breast nudity possible here, question mark, which, yes, you realize, yes, it is possible here and you don't want to get too idealistic because ac- actually you don't have negative feelings about nudity anyway. So you go, yes, Roger, indeed it is. And that, that's the bargain you make with Roger. If you buy his, it's never articulated, I don't think, but if you buy his concept that pictures that audiences like contain these three major elements, action, humor, and sex, and you really buy it and you are you kind of commit to getting as much of that stuff as possible, in there, and if you also want to make a good picture and tell a good story, then the best of both worlds happens. He gets a movie that contains these things, and he's confident of releasing it, and you get a chance to make a picture very much the way you want to make it. I, I know that you've worked with, uh, you, you gave so many people their start, so many great talents their start. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola worked with you before he really worked with anyone else, isn't that true? Yes, right. As a matter of fact, he, uh, he was the sound man, the second assistant director, and shot second unit all on one picture. Really? Very, very versatile. Okay. And did you know then this kid's going places? Actually, I knew he was good. I had no idea that he was going to go to the heights he did. Okay. Uh, Ron Howard, I think, also Ron got Howard one of his first start- directing jobs with yeah. you. Is that right? He started with us as an actor, and the picture was called Eat My Dust, mm-hmm. a car chase film. It was a big success. And he came into the office, and he said, I know you want to do a sequel, when a star plays a role in a successful film, he always asks for more money. Right. I will star in the next picture, no more money, and I will do an additional job. And I said, what is that? And he said, I'll direct. And I said, Ron, you always look like a director to me. No. <laughs> you influence the way film trailers are made. 
I think many people, especially young people, think that film trailers have always been uh, similar. But no, you really changed the way they were made with a certain innovation. What is it you did? Well, it was uh, Joe Dante who went on to become a very uh, well-known, successful director who started cutting trailers for us. And he was cutting one trailer, and I looked at it, and I said, Joe, is this a fairly dull trailer? What can you do to, to jazz it up? He said, come back this afternoon. I went back this afternoon, and there was the same dull trailer. In the middle was an exploding helicopter. It made the trailer... Let me ask you a question. Was there an exploding helicopter in the film? There is no law that says everything in the trailer has... (laughs) That's fantastic. The balls, man. That was incredible. So, I mean, what is it? What, this show would be jazzed up by a, a helicopter crash occasionally. You know, that's the kind of thing that would help a talk show. We you know, they should do you, it everywhere. We could give you the stock footage. You, you would could, you charge me for it? Very little. <laughs> uh, you've got great t- titles, great titles for your films. One of my favorites, Attack of Crab Monsters. Yes. And, uh, and there's, the, of course, the, uh, the title for it. As there, are there so many amazing titles over the, Do you come up with a title first and then decide to shoot the film? How does it work? Sometimes. Um, for instance, Grand Theft Auto, which was Ron Howard's uh, first film as a, as a director, uh, the title came first. But the, Oh, the film he did before, Eat My Dust. I've forgotten the title. We were shooting a car chase somewhere out in the San Fernando Valley, and dust was flying all over the place. And the director said, we had to call this picture Eat My Dust. I said, we will. And he said, I'm joking. I said, I'm not joking. That's a great title. <laughs> so the title came Now, of course, that was Conan O'Brien. And now here's Ron Howard talking about working with Roger Corman. Several conversations that were really significant during the course of making Grand Theft Auto. The first was, he sat me down and said, Ron, I'll come visit you on the first day of filming. And if you're productive, and I, you know, you're making around 20 setups a day, and you're making your days, you, you won't see much of me. In all candor, if you're not achieving those, those kind of results, you're gonna see one hell of a lot of me. That was his little warning. I had a great moment on the Paramount lot. I was finishing up the season of, uh, that season of Happy Days, walking along, and um, uh, as soon as hiatus came in March, I was going to go uh, direct Grand Theft Auto, and Jonathan Demme called me from out, out the window uh, at the, uh, of his second, second uh, story office. He was getting ready to do Citizen Band, I think, uh, and uh, uh, and, of course, I knew him as a Roger Corman veteran. And he, he came bounding down the stairs, and he said, I heard you're going to direct a picture for Roger. Come upstairs. And I went upstairs, and he talked to me for about 20 minutes. He gave me these sheets that he would use to sort of plan out the shot lists and, and the day, and gave me great advice. Here's this young guy saying, make sure you get plenty of sleep. You know, this hipster guy. And, I, and, I, and uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and he basically said, you know... Um, Roger will let you creatively do whatever you want to do. That's the fantastic thing about working for Roger. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you just have to make sure that you, you're efficient and here's how you do it and remember to think ahead and just lots of good fundamentals, but also encouraging me to explore and be creative and really, you know, take advantage of this, of this opportunity that Roger was, was, uh, was giving me. I finally carried my end of a great tradition and cast Roger in Apollo 13. He had a, a very nice scene playing a senator with, uh, with Tom Hanks. And uh, it was a, a, a really wonderful day to reconnect with Roger, have him come. We had, the, you know, it was a big day with green screen and, uh, you know, it was, we, were, we were doing visual effect shots. And, and it was, uh, you know, just uh, A-plus Hollywood filmmaking. And he just smirked and said, uh, well, we could do this for a hell of a lot less. Uh, and, you know, he could. All right, and now my interview with Roger Corman. Before we go to that, I just want to mention I've put together a Roger Corman board. If you're on Pinterest, go to the Indie Film Academy uh, Pinterest account, and I've got an entire board with all kinds of movies and information about Roger Corman there. So check that out, and here we go. 
I was watching the documentary um, Corman's World recently. The thing that I thought was very interesting to see was that you're still going down and, and being on the set. Do you find the same excitement being on a set these days? It's always exciting to be on the set. I'm probably not as excited as earlier, but the, the stimulation is still there. After you've done it, I've made around 300 films. Yeah, there's a certain routine, but there's something always a little bit new. How, is the, how have things changed? I mean, now that you are working in the digital world and video on demand and the sci-fi channel. Have, has your system changed and the way that you go about distribution? It's changed a little bit when you mentioned distribution. It's changed for the better in production, and it's changed, changed at least for those of us working in medium budget and lower budget films. It's changed for the worst in distribution. In production, production is easier. The new digital cameras, the sound equipment, the lighting equipment, Everything is lighter, more portable, easier to use. So you can shoot more on natural locations, and you can shoot faster and more efficiently. So production is better today, the conditions of production. The conditions of distribution, however, are not good for the independents. The major studios today with their $100 million and $200 million budgets and their $30, $40, 50000000 million marketing campaigns have dominated theatrical to such a, an extent that very few uh, medium or low-budget independent uh, pictures get a theatrical distribution. Primarily, we're on uh, DVD, streaming, cable, uh, some broadcast television, and only occasionally in theaters today. Is there a certain period of time that you look back on in your career and kind of reminisce about as being the glory days of filmmaking? Probably for me, the 60s and 70s. The 60s was when I was having uh, most fun and most success as a director. I started directing at around 58 or something like that. First couple of years, you sort of learn what you're doing, and then things started to move for me in the 60s. And in the 70s, I started my own production and distribution company, and I moved from directing to producing and distributing, and that was a whole new world as well. So for that, about a 20-year period, uh, I was probably having uh, the most fun and the most success. Uh, things still work out. I'm still producing, still distributing, but I make fewer films today, and uh, just that. Uh, I make fewer films. Uh, they get a limited distribution, and I'll continue for a few more years. You started out working as a writing notes on screenplays, right? And you eventually did some notes for The Gun the, the gun gunfighter, fighter, right? Yes. The, Actually, right. I, I started up, I graduated from Stanford with a degree in engineering, and I was a failure of the Stanford engineering class. <laughs> I got the worst job of anybody. I got a job as a messenger at Fox for $32.50 a week. <laughs> and I rode the bike around the studio delivering messages. <laughs> and then I'm, I worked fairly hard, did put, did some extra work, and became a reader in the story department. And that was where I, uh, I first got a little bit of uh, minor recognition for my work on The Gunfighter. I, I didn't like various things that were going on. So uh, I had some uh, college time left on the GI Bill, so I went to Europe, went to Oxford briefly, and then came back and uh, became a literary agent and sold my own script under an assumed name and I took the money from that and uh, uh, started my production company. How did you, did you know how it was all going to work and where you were going to sell the film, or did you just kind of go into it like a leap of faith? It was a total leap of faith. I, I think back and I wonder how I had the nerve to do it. <laughs> Well, I think that, you know, your career has shown that you've, you've taken a lot of leaps of faith like that. And, and now did you, when you first started, did, did you have the idea that you could keep a career going as long as you were making films at a low enough price that you could always sell them? It wasn't quite that easy. Okay. Um, I financed my films with my own money 
And since I don't have that much money, uh, I can't make uh, giant films. So uh, the budget level was more or less predetermined. And I don't really think or ever thought of it as how long can I keep going. I just felt that everything is going well. I'll continue making films. So there was a little bit of a sort of a long-term plan, but to a large extent, it was day-to-day. Uh, I'm going to make this film. I'm shooting this film. Uh, I'm planning the next film and so forth. What did you learn from making films that people really wanted to see? You ab- obviously tapped into something in the marketplace that was selling tickets and got people coming in and got people excited. Are there any sort of things that are specific to your films that really kind of you, you developed and learned how to sell a film? Well, early on, I appealed to a teenage audience. I was very much aware that uh, the audience was a young audience and the major studios were casting their great stars, which meant to a large extent a 50-year-old leading man making love to a 40-year-old leading lady, and the average (laughs) age of the audience was 18. Um, So I felt, uh, and I totally understood why they did it, their stars were the equivalent of of brands. Uh, Their stars were famous and could sell tickets. But uh, I felt if I went with young people, I could appeal directly to a young audience, and I worked in genres. I, not always, but generally, I was doing action pictures, horror films, science fiction films, sometimes deliberately straight teenage films and so forth. Were there any other movies, like genre films, they were fairly non-mainstream back in those days. I mean, nowadays, it seems like horror movies are very mainstream, and and especially science fiction and everything, especially after Star Wars and all those sorts of movies. But back in in those days, was it something that was more of like a drive-in movie theater or more like B-movies? Yes. Uh, the drive-ins were very important. They weren't quite as important as people think they were. Um, our main money still came from what we called the hard tops, the enclosed theaters. But drive-ins were a major uh, source of income. And the drive-in audience was even younger than the hard top audience. Although drive-ins did attract some families on the basis that a uh, young family with children uh, who couldn't afford a babysitter or something could just go to the drive-in, put the children in the back seat, watch the picture, and the children would maybe just go to sleep. So it was an inexpensive uh, night out for them. But <laughs> it, it still was uh, primarily uh, a young audience. Do you think we've missed something now that we don't have theaters and we don't like go out and see movies now that everybody's watching movies on iPads and on TV? Yes, I think there's something to be said for seeing a picture, particularly a comedy, uh, with an audience. You pick up the vibes, as it were, unconsciously from the audience. It becomes a communal or shared experience. I was watching the 1978 documentary called Corman Hollywood's Wild Angel. You can actually, it's actually on YouTube. And it was one of, uh, probably one of the most, I learned so much in two hours of just watching that. It was incredible. And th- th- there's a great um, scene where uh, they're talking with Jonathan Demi, and he's talking about the advice that you gave him as a filmmaker. And I thought it was really interesting, and I just wanted to get your um, thoughts on that. And he said that the three most important elements in a film were humor, action, and sex. And sex was last, but it was still important. Do you still feel like that? I think I think that I would put in uh, the narrative storyline. Uh, I should have said that. But that was probably <laughs> that was probably understood. <laughs> What are your, some of your favorite movies that you um, have seen lately, you know, more contemporary people? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, possibly the most interesting uh, film I saw last year was a film that for three quarters of the way through, I thought was one of the most brilliant films I had ever seen. And then it started to fall at the end. And uh it was never recognized in any way, I think, for special effects, Interstellar, which I thought uh-huh. was really a brilliant film, particularly, as I say, my degree was in engineering, but I had a minor in physics, and maybe it was unique to me. I tried to stay up with physics, and it was really very accurate from all the concepts of uh of of physics today, the last quarter or so, it started to get a little questionable. uh, (laughs) uh, 
didn't totally hold up. But I think for the reason that, that as I say, it was so brilliant, so far through, and then still was I still think of it as possibly the best picture of the year um, but uh, nobody else seems to agree with me or a few people agree agree with me one of the things that I had heard that you mentioned was that after the film The Intruder you had decided that you didn't want to be as um, which is a brilliant film but I, I actually just saw it for the first time a couple of days ago that you had decided to try and not you know have a movie that was commercial but have a, a movie within that movie that actually had a message and was a good movie within a movie that was sellable. Yes, I felt that I had become too serious with The Intruder. It got a lot of critical acclaim, won a couple of minor film festivals, but was commercially uh, not successful. And I felt I was too serious. I was lecturing the audience, and I felt what I would do would be to make a film an entertainment with, as we say, a method acting, a text and a subtext. The text is the entertainment of the film, and the subtext would be whatever was important to me or whatever I wanted to say, but it would be always be secondary to uh, the text of the film. Now, were you one of the first people to take the camera off the tripod and, and go out into the streets and kind of shoot off of sets? Was that something that, that you felt was, you know, would bring more realism to your um, film, say, in the 60s? Yes, I was one of the first. I wouldn't say I was the first. There was, I know uh, a number of people were doing it before me, but I was one of the first to do it, and I liked that concept very much. I'd been doing uh, my Edgar Allan Poe pictures with Vincent Price, and those were deliberately studio-bound. I wanted to have total control of everything within a studio, leaving nothing to chance. And I wanted to, re and when I until I had done enough of those films, uh, I wanted to go completely away from that, go into the streets and shoot the world around me as uh, as I interpreted it during the 60s, which of course was a very volatile de decade. You mentioned working with Vincent Price and the Poe films. Can you talk a little bit about horror and your, your feeling about horror movies? Well, horror is very complex. It's exceedingly complex. You can get horror very easily by cutting off somebody's arm or something like that. I'm not talking about that kind of uh, horror. I'm talking about horror uh, as a psychological concept. And I think the roots go so deep into a person's individual experience, into the whole experience of humanity, that it's a fascinating genre in which to work. You were distributing a lot of films from foreign filmmakers. I was wondering if you had any favorite filmmakers from that, you know, like Kurosawa or um, Bergman. What what your favorite films were um, from that kind of well, group I, of people? I would pick a few. Uh, some of the filmmakers, uh, Fellini, Bergman, Kurosawa, a number of others. Uh, uh, the first one I had was Cries and Whispers uh, from Bergman, which was, I thought, a brilliant film. Uh, let me see, uh, Kurosawa's Durza Uzula, which is an unusual film for him, which won uh, uh, Academy Award Best Foreign Film. Fellini's picture, uh, I've forgotten the, the title of it, uh, but I had a film from Fellini uh, that uh, also won the Academy. We won, I think in a certain number of six or seven years, we won more uh, foreign Academy Awards than everybody else combined. <laughs> Now, were you were you able to meet with those directors? Did you you know have any relationship with them, and and did you learn things from them? Yes, I met I met several of them, talked with some several of them. Fellini said you should get out of distributing and go back to directing. I remember that. <laughs> he said, "Why did you ever leave?" <laughs> You, you've obviously had a great influence on a lot of the, the people that my generation considers the best filmmakers of, you know, the, the 70s and the people who really influenced us moving into the, the 80s. Now, when I when I watch a movie by, you know, Martin Scorsese or um, Francis Ford Coppola, do you, when you watch movies that they make, do you see your influence in what they make? I mean, for example, camera movement and, you know, keeping things going? A little bit, but basically uh, they are their own people. Uh, 
they were uh, good before uh, they even met me. They had the talent. I may have taught them a few things, but basically, uh, they're brilliant filmmakers. They would have been brilliant filmmakers if they'd never met me. What do all these people have in common, the, the great filmmakers, the James Camerons and, and all these guys that you work with? What is there something that you saw in them that just made them great? Well, I've been asked that question before, and I would say there are three things. One, every one of them was intelligent. I've never met uh, a successful writer, producer, or director who's been successful over a long period of time who wasn't intelligent. The second was the ability to work. Making films on, to a certain extent is glamorous and exciting, but also it is very, very hard work. Those two things you can kind of figure out. The third is creativity. They are all creative, and that you only learn uh, about a person by working with them. I also watched Death Race 2000, and I was wondering if you, when you watched The Hunger Games, <laughs> if you had any reaction to that. I definitely had that reaction, both in Death Race <laughs> and its follow-up picture, Death Sport. Death Sport, a number of things went wrong. It's not a good picture, but the thoughts <laughs> in it, uh, and uh, uh, Death Race, on the other hand, was a pretty good picture. It won some poll. It's the greatest B picture of all time. Uh, I think <laughs> without question, some of the thoughts in Death Race and Death Sport are in the Hunger Games and some other things. On the other hand, as far as I know, Death Race and Death Sport were totally original, but if, if I say that, there's going to be somebody who will say, you're forgetting the German expressionist film of 1919 that had the <laughs> same concept. So you can never say you were really the, the first. And it's very possible that uh, I think whoever wrote uh, The Hunger Games had never seen uh, Death Sport or Death Race. Uh, they probably thought they were doing something uh, totally original as well. <laughs> well, it also reminded me a lot of Mad Max and uh... – Actually, more like Mad Max too. You know, did you did you ever see that connection? Yes. Who was the? Um, actually, the, the, in that case, he's an Australian director. He told me he had seen right. it. He had seen Death Race. George like, Miller. Yeah. Yes. George, yes. And um, he said he had seen Death Race, and he said he was inspired by him. And but he didn't copy anything. He got a general idea of a genre and did two brilliant original films. Right. Because well, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, the thing that 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 you feel when you watch that is just the danger. You know, you feel the speed, and you feel like, I mean, that's one of the things that films I think have lost a lot nowadays is just the actual. You know, you're doing everything in camera. There's not really any visual effects. I mean, there might be there was like a matte painting I remember, but other than that, I mean, everything is real and not like digital effects. So you can, when I watch movies like that, it's a lot realer than watching, you know, some of these movies that are like the superhero movies where you know that they can do it all in a computer. Yes. Um, uh, and I think the audience unconsciously knows that. They can sense it uh, to a certain extent. The stunts that can be done today are far superior to what we were doing in camera. What you can do with a computer uh, are just light years ahead. Yet at the same time, the audience almost senses they're too good. They know this can't really be. Now, um, I wanted to talk for just a second I, about if you could give a little bit of a lot of people that listen to this are first time filmmakers and people that are try, out there trying to make you know their first independent films. Can you talk a little bit about what people can do to have success in the film industry and, and make a film that's, like you said, a, a, a movie that is good, but also a film that will sell and that can keep them going? Well, as William Goldman once said, uh, nobody knows anything. Uh, he's. Partially true, but I would say this, a lot of people have a general idea. You don't know, but you have a general idea. So I could say a few things, and even before I say them, I will know that somebody will go out and do something totally opposite from what I say you should do and have a giant success and do it brilliantly. <laughs> so it really depends upon the ability of the filmmaker, but probably it's a not get into a, a deep, long discussion. The one thing that I would say 
is most important is preparation, particularly if you have a short schedule or a small budget. You want to do as much of your thinking as you possibly can before you ever appear on the set. You want to have your story worked out. You want to have talked with your actors, worked out the basic um a red line, as Stanislavski said, of the actor's performance. You want to have your own shots sketched out, knowing, however, you will never follow your plan exactly. Something that will happen that causes you to change. Sometimes it's the better. Sometimes you'll get a better idea. But uh, I put heavy, heavy emphasis on pre-production planning. Is that how you were able to do Little Shop of Horrors <laughs> in two days? Yes, we rehearsed three days. I, what happened, a uh, studio had these sets. Uh, they, we just shot on sets that were there. That's the reason I made the picture. And um, I knew that if, uh, the Screen Actors Guild at that time, I think it's still this way, uh, hiring an actor for five days for a week is not much more expensive than hiring. As a matter of fact, it's about as expensive it was to hire an actor for a week as for three days on a daily rate. So I hired all the actors for a week. We rehearsed three days and then went in and shot for two days, having worked everything out in the first three. I Actually, I have to ask you this. Now, I know that you, you're a fan of Stanley Kubrick, right? Yes. I, I was wondering how you did you feel about The Shining when you saw that, and did you talk to Jack Nicholson about that after? I did. I thought The Shining. I think uh, uh, Kubrick is one of the, the great, great directors, and I think The Shining is one of his best films. I'm not certain okay. it's his best film, but it's one of his best films. So I have total admiration for Stanley and for that picture. And Jack was brilliant in it. I do have one story that Jack told me uh, when we were working. People used to say. I printed the first take. I seldom did, but I print generally the second or third take or something like that. Stanley is famous for shooting and shooting and shooting. He went over a hundred takes on one shot with Jack, and Jack is a good guy. He stood there and he went until Stanley printed, you know, the 112th or 113th take. And when he was finished, he went over to Stanley and said, Stanley, I'm with you all the way, but you have to know, I generally peak around the 70th or 80th take. (laughs) Did you ever have a chance to meet uh, Stanley Kubrick? I met him once, just talked to him briefly early in his career. He had done his first film was um, a crime story built around a racetrack. And um, it was a medium, low-budget film. And... uh, I remember it was after he had done that, and I was just talking to him, and I said, this is one of the best, if not the best, first films I've ever seen. And it was clear from there that he was going to have a brilliant career. Was that The Killers? Yes, that's what it was. I had forgotten. Right. That had a brilliant ending, too, with the the suitcase and the money flying out of it and everything. Yes. I always end my my, um, interviews with two questions. One is, do you have a resource like a book or something that's been very influential to your life or or something that you can recommend to filmmakers? Well, I'll give you an answer that doesn't uh, apply exactly. The most influential book to me was when I was in college studying math and I studied calculus. Uh, The whole concept of calculus, which is to a certain extent could be described as the mathematics of movement, the problems of calculus, well, I won't get into it and all of that. Calculus, the, the problem and the solving of the problem, I thought was so brilliant and such uh, an example of what the creative mind can do that that's probably influenced me more than any other book. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself when you were 20 years old, what advice would you have for yourself? I would probably say at the age of 20 to try to get as broad and varied an education as you possibly can. Uh, I think the fact that um, I majored in engineering caused me to specialize too much in a certain branch of knowledge, whereas a liberal education encompassing literature, art, philosophy, economics, psychology, all of that is the best preparation for a full life, whether professionally or personally. 
did you follow that because you felt like you had to have something to kind of fall back on and to have a career? Well, my or? father was an engineer, and I simply started off to follow his in, in his footsteps. And it wasn't until uh, I became the film critic of the Stanford Daily and uh, started analyzing films that I realized this is what I, I wanted to do. But uh, I'd spent four years uh, studying engineering. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever use any of that knowledge for, for filmmaking? Well, as I say, going back to calculus, I use some of the knowledge, but I also use some of the way in which you think as an engineer or a physicist or a mathematician. There's a thought process of problem solving, which can be very creative and very satisfying and very useful at the same time. Well, I, I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time and, and talking with me. Very good. I thank you. All right, that's going to do it for today. I want to thank my guest, Mr. Roger Corman, for coming on the show. And we'll be back next Tuesday. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Academy podcast. Don't forget to join our newsletter for more tips and tricks on how to make and market your film online. Go to www.indiefilmacademy.com.